Well, good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, so many people here this evening uh, to this uh, lecture. Uh, the Genomics Forum, which is hosting this lecture, is part of the Economic and Social Research Council's Genomics Network, which is a network of uh, three centres plus us, as it were, or four centres, the others being Sesogen, which is Cardiff and Lancaster, Igenis, which is based in Exeter, and Inogen, which is also based here in Edinburgh. And this network has been established, um, I, I for, forgive me uh, for repeating this to those who, who know this, but for those who don't, it's been established by the Ec Economic and Social Research Council to explore the social and economic context and consequences of developments in the life sciences, especially those flowing from uh, the mapping of the genome. And the forum, uh, which is hosting this event, has a particular responsibility to present and develop the policy-relevant aspects of the research work which the other centres are doing. And in this work, we attach uh, great importance to engaging with natural scientists who are at the forefront of current research. For that reason, it's a very great pleasure to welcome uh, Ian Wilmot this evening. There's no development, it seems to me, in the life sciences in the last 25 years at least, which has captured, captured the public imagination quite as has the cloning of Dolly the Sheep by Ian Wilmot and his colleagues when he was at Roslyn. I was struck by this cycling in November through a very poor and very remote uh, village in the Jordan, um, noticing a crowd of boys who I thought were about to throw stones at me. One of them had a T-shirt on with a picture of uh, 20 identical sheep with the name Dolly and her sisters um, underneath, and that was in a very remote part of um, Jordan. I was trying to forget the University of Edinburgh, actually, but, um, but I didn't succeed. Anyway, many of you will know that um, Ian Wilmot has recently joined the University of Edinburgh, where he's to head the new Centre for Regenerative Medicine. And the Forum is delighted uh, to have this opportunity, or provided this opportunity for this audience, to hear something of uh, Professor Wilmot's present and future research, which is without question at the forefront of scientific and public interest. Ian Wilmot's distinction is of such a kind that we uh, felt bound to have a distinguished respondent, and I'm going to welcome now, rather than after Ian has spoken, uh, Paleb Ghosh, who is to respond uh, to him. Known to many of you, um, I'm sure, or probably all of you, I should say, as the BBC science correspondent, a noted observer and commentator on scientific developments over um, this period. I know very well that it's quite a long period, since it's nearly 18 years ago that I spent, I think, three hours getting colder and colder in a field of cows in East Anglia talking to him about embryo transfer. Not just him, I should say. There was a, a film crew there at the time. Otherwise, it would be a particularly odd uh, and surreal occasion. But, uh, uh, but he is a distinguished commentator. He's flown in from uh, the Kennedy Institute, Space Institute or NASA or whatever. But anyway, where they launch rockets in America. So we're delighted that he's here too. So without more ado, may I call on you, Professor Wilmot, uh, with great pleasure to deliver your lecture, Cells from hu Cloned Human Embryos and Research and Therapy, Unraveling the Issues. Thank you very much. Can I say immediately how glad I am to have the opportunity to discuss our research with you and then to deal with questions that Palab may raise or that you yourselves may raise at, at the end. There, there are always a number of acknowledgements that I like to make at the beginning of a, a lecture. The first is of the funding agencies that have supported the research and they are listed across the, the bottom here. Uh, the University Roslyn Institute, um, some British government funding agencies, uh, the European Union and Geron, which is a, a biotech company based in California. And I should also tell you, I think, that I own some of their shares. So you may think that I'm, I'm biased in some of my opinions. But perhaps the most important acknowledgement is to the people who have done the research, um, which has provided the basis for this new opportunity. And of course, um, most of these people have been involved in thinking through the opportunities and, and assessing them. These are really the people who've done the research. It's my privilege to, to travel and to talk about it. There's one specific group which I should acknowledge last, 
before I move into the, the real information. There are a group of five of us who are developing the use of cloning to study inherited disease, and they're, they're listed here. Uh, the four, top four at the University of Edinburgh, Richard Anderson is a clinician and uh, responsible for recovering oocytes from donors, myself and my group. Paul D'Souza has derived human embryo stem cells from uh, fertilized embryos, uh, an expertise that we need. Jim McGuire is at the Roslyn Institute still and has experience of differentiating cells. Our, our collaborator, our clinical collaborator, Chris Shaw, is at King's College in London, and he is both a clinician uh, and uh, an active, distinguished research worker in the field of neurodegenerative disease. And so it's this group that has the uh, HFEA license, for example, and which has been involved in developing that project. The starting point that we would have is really to, to suggest that an understanding of the cause of inherited diseases is really essential for the development of new treatments. It's a critical step. And the disease that we have in mind is variously known as ALS, motor neuron disease, or Lou Gehrig's disease, depending on which country you're in. In this country, we tend to use the name motor neuron disease. Uh, in the States, ALS or Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig, of course, was a famous baseball player who sadly had motor neuron disease. I'm sure you'll anticipate that the the lady in the wheelchair has uh, motor neuron disease. So let me tell you a, a little bit about the disease. It, it kills about 130,000 people a year worldwide. That's equivalent to 1,200 people in the United Kingdom. What happens is that the patient loses control of, of muscles, uh, sometimes starting with the arms, with the legs, and a progressive loss of control uh, of uh, the body muscles, ultimately usually leading to the death of the patient because they stop breathing. I'm going to show you some evidence in a while to show you that it's a, really a family of diseases, but in the most common uh, case, the first symptoms appear at age 54, 55, and the person will die, sadly, in three years or so. The phrase that Chris uses to describe the condition is that it is relentlessly progressive. And I think, I don't know, do we have anybody in the room who has the disease? Or somebody who has a family member who has the disease? No. I think we can, it's important to think about the situation of a person who is told that they have motor neuron disease. What they noticed perhaps was that their foot trailed on the floor or perhaps they were not able to use their arms quite so strongly. And they're told that this is the, the reason why. One of the people in this country who has the disease is Jimmy Johnson, the former Celtic football player with whom I've had a number of conversations and I've had the privilege of visiting him once. One of those telephone calls was after a, a, an interval. So as you do when you see people again or speak to them for the first time for a while, you say, well, how are you? How are you, Jimmy? And he said to me, well, son, I've lost the use of my arms. Now, perhaps we should just think for a moment what we've used our arms for since we got up this morning. To wash, to dress, to go to the toilet, any number of things. So this is a, a very unpleasant, debilitating disease which is not understood and for which at the present time there is no treatment. As I indicated, it's really a family of diseases, and you can illustrate that again by thinking of a well-known British person who has one of the forms of the disease, Stephen Hawking, the astronomer, who first showed symptoms when he was about 20 and is now more than 60. So clearly he has lived very, very much longer, but is uh, debilitated in the same, same way. In some cases, the disease is inherited, and the ratio between the two genders is equal there, but in others it's not. And as you can see from the, the pie chart, the, there are more men than women who have this disease. In fact, in 10% of cases, there is a distinct family history. In other words, if a person has it, half their children, on average, will inherit it. 
a dominant inheritance. And in 20% of those cases, that's 2% of the total, it's associated with errors in a particular gene. SOD1 is the, the name. Despite very intensive research by molecular biologists, geneticists, for a long period, only one gene has so far been identified, although that sort of analysis suggests that there are at least four other loci which are associated with this dominant inheritance. So that, that, that again provides evidence that it's a family of diseases. Unfortunately, for various reasons, because of the fact that it is lethal, um, all sorts of other factors, it is a difficult disease to study, to carry out a classical genetic an analysis. Once a, a molecular biologist has identified the fact that a particular gene is associated with a disease in a dominant way, the first thing that they would do is to turn to an experimental animal and think th of the questions that they could ask. And in this case, the first question would be, what happens if I turn off that gene in the animal? Is the illness due to a, a loss of function? And so that's been done by standard molecular biology techniques to turn off the functioning of SOD1. And it does not produce symptoms similar to motor neuron disease. On the other hand, if you take one of the damaged copies of the human gene and introduce it into the mouse in such a way that it's expressed at a high level, those mice do develop motor neuron disease or something similar. And so the conclusion which would be drawn from these analyses is that this isn't a loss of function. It's an effect of having a corrupted protein, a damaged protein in the cells of the brain. And that it's that which in some unknown way over a long period of time triggers the, the ultimate symptoms. And those of us who are know about Alzheimer's disease and so on, will recognize that there's something common perhaps to some of these neurodegenerative diseases, that they do seem, or they may be associated with the presence of corrupted proteins. Now, of course, having identified the fact that mice can be produced that have the disease or something similar, it is possible to think of using experimental animals to assess drugs that might prevent further degeneration. This, of course, itself raises ethical issues. But that is done, it, it has been done, continues to be done. But there are serious limitations. It clearly takes time for the symptoms to appear. And it's possible to test very few drugs, a handful in a year, at a cost of tens of thousands of pounds. So it's a slow process. And so this naturally is leading to research workers active in the field, people like our collaborator, asking whether it's possible to study the disease in a different way using cells. And this, of course, is where we turn, first of all, to embryo stem cells, not necessarily from cloned embryos. So let me remind you a little about embryo stem cells, which are derived from blastocysts a stage of development which in humans is reached after about six days after, after fertilization. I'll show you a picture and discuss this rather more later in the talk. And methods have been established for human, for mouse, one or two other species, for, for taking some of the cells from that blastocyst stage, culturing them in a little dish, in such an environment that a population is isolated which has the characteristics of being very long-lived. It's tempting to call them immortal, but that's a slight exaggeration probably. Very long-lived. And in the right circumstances, they do not change. But on the other hand, they retain the ability to form all of the different tissues of an adult. So that in terms of human embryo stem cells, if you change the environment in which they're being cultured, by adding specific growth factors into the medium, then you can induce them to change into many different cell types. I've shown in the diagram cardiomyocytes, heart muscle, and different neuropopulations. There's still a, a great deal to learn about this process, but in principle, it will become possible over a period of time to derive different cell populations from human embryo stem cells in a predictable and reproducible way. 
And of course, that creates opportunities for study of motor neuron disease. Once it's possible, and it, we're approaching this time now, to derive motor neurons and other neural cell types from the embryo stem cells, it will be possible to study the molecular functioning in those cells, to compare healthy cells with those which are known to have the characteristics of motor neuron disease, to identify the cause of the change. It's not even clear to the people active in this field which of the different neural populations is actually first affected in the disease. Clearly, motor neurons are ultimately affected, but it's not clear that they're the site of the primary lesion. So that question can be asked. And most important of all, it would become possible to carry out high-throughput drug screens, where for the same amount of money, it would be possible to test thousands of drugs within a year or so. A high-throughput screen which would provide a preliminary selection of those compounds which are able to prevent the changes associated with motor neuron disease. This would be a very effective way of selecting, cell, of selecting drugs for testing in animals and perhaps for use later in, in patients. The question is, how do you have cells which have the characteristics of motor neuron disease? Well, remember that there is one gene which is known to cause the symptoms of motor neuron disease. So one technique is to have the embryo stem cells in culture, to add uh, copies of a damaged form of the gene in such a way that uh, it's known that it will be expressed at a very high level. And then you would have cells which would be expected to have the characteristics of a patient who has motor neuron disease. This research is technically possible now. It's going on in Edinburgh and in London and probably in other laboratories around the world. There is no need for the development of new techniques uh, for this particular approach to be followed. But SOD1 is only known to be associated with 2% of cases, 20% of the 10% that have a familial form, 2% overall. And there are perhaps four or five other regions where there is a dominant effect of a mutated gene. And this is where cloning comes in, to give us an opportunity to study um, the other forms of the disease. So to go through that in some detail, to do nuclear transfer, you have to have two cells. In this context, you have to have one which is taken from a person who has inherited the disease. And you're as confident as you can be that this is a dominant inheritance. You also have to have an unfertilized egg donated by a woman perhaps going through IVF treatment, an egg which has not been fertilized, or perhaps specific requests that they should donate to a site. Uh, I'll come back to those issues later on. And you can then use the technique of nuclear transfer, first of all, to remove the genetic information from the egg, and then to transfer across the genetic information from the patient. And because the disease is known to be associated with the chromosomes, and not the mitochondria, you can be confident that that developing embryo will have the characteristics of motor neuron disease. The next stage would be to culture the embryo for six days or so until it reaches the blastocyst stage, before in principle then it would be possible to derive embryo stem cells and the different neural populations that we want to study. Most of the steps that are involved in this process have been achieved. We'll return to the fact later on that the cloning one is now the one link which is missing. But the other steps of deriving embryo stem cells, of differentiating into neural populations, have been achieved. This is the only way of obtaining neural populations of a particular genetic makeup. They can't be obtained from neural stem cells at the present time. So let's just have a, a look at nuclear transfer in, in sheep as it was carried out by Bill Ritchie at uh, the Roslyn Institute. What you see here are unfertilized uh, sheep eggs and the pipette on the left, the larger one, which will be used to hold the unfertilized egg and the smaller one on the right, which will make the changes. 
you'll see in a moment that, or you won't see in the moment, because the diagram makes things look, look easy. You cannot actually see the genetic information because farm animal eggs are opaque. What you can see, perhaps those of you near the front anyway, is that at the side of the egg there, there is a body known as the polar body. And that will be near to the, the chromosomes. And so the pipette has been pushed against the egg to allow the cytoplasm in that area to be removed. The egg's been incubated in the presence of a dye which binds to DNA. So it's taken out of the field of view, ultraviolet light switched on, and you're looking to see two fluorescent bodies. One is the group of chromosomes you want, the other is in the polar body. If you see them both, you know that the nucleation has been successful and you can continue. If you don't, you either have to try again or discard the other cell. The other cell, remember, is the small donor cell which will provide the genetic information. These are fibroblasts of, of some kind. Normally, Bill would operate on 10 or so oocytes at one time, and so he will pick up a group of oocytes before we see in the last part of the video the actual transfer of the cell. The way in which we actually carry out nuclear transfer is by fusing the cells together, not actually transferring the nucleus as, as, as such. So what he's attempting to do, what he will do, is to put the cell in the space between the cell of the egg and the membrane around it. Those of you near the front will see it. I'm sorry to those at the back. Uh, unless you have particularly good eyesight, you won't be able to see it. He then can push the two cells together uh, because that's important from the point of view of the subsequent cell fusion. Cell fusion and activation of the egg, stimulation of the egg, is achieved by applying electric current. This is not the way that nuclear transfer was carried out by the group in Korea, but it is the way that we would carry it out here, essentially the same process. So now, in, let's consider what opportunities become available if we can derive embryo stem cells from cloned embryos. Well, first of all, there are the other 8% of cases where it's known to be a dominant inheritance, but where the mutation is not known. And these are the really important group. There is no other way of obtaining cells of that gene attack than by using nuclear transfer. Of course, the great majority of cases do not run in families. Clinicians would use the word sporadic. But it's very likely that there is some inherited vulnerability in those families. And so in due time, it would be interesting to study them, to, produce, to study stem cells derived from their embryos, to try to identify the weakness. As a technical matter, which is very important, in order to look to see whether cloning itself introduced abnormalities, we would also want to clone from cells which have the SOD1 mutations because that would enable us to compare the same genotype uh, either produced by nuclear transfer or by, produced by fertilization. And that gives us a very direct comparison of the effect of cloning itself. Because a key scientific question is, does the cloning process, which we all know is very inefficient, introduce so many abnormalities that we cannot detect those changes which are due to the disease? And our specific aim in the license that we have is to study one disease in great detail and answer this question. Of course, you also have the opportunity to study stem cells from fertilized embryos, donated embryos, as a, as a control overall. And so I, I would remind you that the objectives of the project are not to offer cells for therapy, but to understand the disease, to identify a change which can be used in high throughput drug screens and to use that hopefully to identify drugs which would stop further degeneration. <coughs> <coughs> it may seem a rather limited ambition, but to be able to tell somebody who is undergoing that degeneration that you have a treatment which would prevent further degeneration would be a very significant step forward. So let's think how this approach might be used one day in therapy. And we believe very strongly that in 
the haste to discuss this potential application of the technology, people have overlooked the potential benefits of what we've, I've described first of all. We think that there are immense benefits, and I'll discuss some other diseases at the end of the talk, there are immense benefits to be gained from using this approach to understand basic development, to understand abnormalities in disease, and, and therefore to have new approaches to treatment of disease, well before we should think of large-scale application of cell therapy from cloned embryos. This is so well discussed that I, I scarcely need to go through it, but on the left, there's a list of diseases which are a result of damage to cells, either from disease or accident, cells which are not repaired or replaced. So spinal cord injury, liver damage, heart attack, diabetes, Parkinson's disease, infertility. Actually, a very different, a very variable set of diseases. The approach to treating these will have to vary. But nonetheless, in one way or another, people may use cells to try and treat these diseases, or will use cells to treat these diseases in the not too distant future. There are, in fact, a, a number of other potential uses of cells from cloned embryos which are listed here, which I, I don't have the time to go into, but I'd be, I'd be glad to discuss. And there are specific examples. I, I think, again, the second one, which is using the approach for drug discovery in a more general way, uh, will also prove to be very important. Until just before Christmas, we all thought that the technology that we were wishing to use had been established by the group in Korea. So this is the critical summary of the information published by Professor Wang in Science last summer. Unfortunately, we now all know that those, those observations were fraudulent. I think they may have made some progress, and it would be nice to know exactly what they had achieved, but they had not established a routine uh, procedure. This means that there are only very limited observations as to what has been achieved. One or two groups who have produced a small number of low-quality blastocysts. But nobody has described the derivation of a stem cell line from a cloned blastocyst. If it is possible, or when it is possible, it is likely to be at a very low efficiency. Nonetheless, it is our intention to continue with our proposal to study the disease using human oocytes. We've had our own thoughts about the circumstances in which donation would be appropriate. We would prefer to accept donations only if the woman has had children. I know that people can change their mind, change their circumstances and want children further on, but we think it's in everybody's interest not to accept donation from very young women. We do not propose to give a very high level of hormone stimulation, as was followed in uh, Korea, because it's the high level of hormone stimulation which I'm told causes most of the side effects, the nausea. It also carries the greatest, there isn't a big risk, but the risk which is there comes from overstimulation, the risk of overstimulation. And so my colleagues have already be do been doing research with oocytes, with eggs taken from very small follicles without hormone stimulation. And groups in Sweden and in Finland are using oocytes obtained in this way as part of fertility treatment. And so our, our preference will be to suggest that the woman uh, allows us to aspirate to take those eggs, but without undergoing a, a high level of hormone stimulation. Just to make clear to you one or two points, uh, in this country, as in others, it is not possible to pay donors. So donors will be altruistic. And, and I sh can mention that we have uh, been approached a number of times by uh, women wishing to help in this way. It's clear that research can begin, but particularly if we're expecting that the efficiency will be rather low and not at the level described and claimed by Professor Wang, the oocyte supply <coughs> will soon be limiting. I think it's for that reason that a number of groups have begun to think of transferring nuclei from one species into eggs of another. For some reason, I don't know the, the, the history, the species which has been chosen most often is the rabbit. And there is a group in Shanghai 
who first of all described in 2003 the production of blastocysts on the left-hand side, the derivation of stem cell lines, and proof that they expressed uh, markers characteristic of stem cells on the right-hand side. There is a second group uh, working in China who have not yet published their information, but I'm told that they have repeated this work independently. There is a group in uh, Japan who are not able to do this, but have put macaque, a non-human primate, macaque nuclei into rabbit oocytes and produce blastocysts and got substantial development. <coughs> so there is reason to think you can get considerable development from this combination. Just to give you the real figures from, from Shanghai, the group uh, successfully fused almost 1,000 embryos, 894, and obtained 107 blastocysts. They weren't at that stage uh, describing the number of cell lines. But 12% efficiency is actually quite good and, and, and quite encouraging. Of course, one of the developments in modern science has been to demonstrate to us the extent to which we have proteins which are very similar to those in yeast or plants or rabbits. And so presumably this success, if that's what it is, reflects that the fact that there are sufficient proteins in the egg to at least begin to support uh, early development. I want now to change the emphasis and think about different things for a while. I hope you recognize the photograph on the right, which is of this room. And if it's the first time you've been in it, I hope you'll take the time to, to look around, not just at the architecture, but the, the paintings and the staircase and the sculpture. It's a magnificent room. The sketch on the right, of course, is of, of the old college. The design for that, the start for that, was in the middle of the 18th century. But it wasn't completed under the guidance, ultimately, of William Playfair, hence this is called the Playfair Library until the middle of the 19th century. And so you can say that this represents 1800. And what I want to do for a few minutes is to think about the way in which life has changed in the 200 years since then. And to consider the way in which scientific knowledge and technical knowledge has contributed to those changes. To mention to you the fact that at various points there have been scientific controversies. It's within the very nature of science that there will be heated debate about the meaning of new observations and how to interpret things. And of course in, in some contexts there's been ethical debate about whether what was being suggested in, by way of treatment of people or animals was a, an ethically acceptable thing to do. So what's changed in the last 200 years? We found figures on the Scottish Executive website for lifespan of people born in 1800 and the estimated figures for those, <coughs> those born about now. And we've averaged the figure for the two genders. And you can see that overall the average lifespan has almost doubled. Now, of course, there have been a great many things that have contributed to this. Political changes, social changes. But I would suggest to you that a key part to it was scientific knowledge, an ap ap effective application of that knowledge. Another difference, and it's, of course, very different, difficult to provide a, a very precise comparison because the boundaries of Edinburgh have changed. But the figures that we're offering you are from Edinburgh and Leith, which we hope is a reasonably effective way of looking at population change in that 200 years. And for those of you at the back, it's gone up um, from roughly 81,000 to 450,000 in that 200-year period. So one simple conclusion as to what would happen, what would have happened if we'd gone on living in the way of life of 1800 is that most of us wouldn't be here. 
Because at some point in that 200 year period, one of our ancestors would have died before they had the opportunity to reproduce. I may be an example in that my father was a type one diabetic and developed the symptoms some years before he met my mother. And I don't think we could be confident that he would have lived long enough to be able to, to marry and have children. Huge changes in our opportunities because of scientific and technical knowledge, among other things. Completely different area of knowledge, the universe. This is a sketch of the world from around the time of Ptolemy, around the time of Christ, when it was considered that the earth was at the center of the world and what the drawing shows is the planets and the sun at ever increasing distance. So we have the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, and so on. And of course at that time it was considered, if you like, that there was a sort of umbrella up above the world. That's what the sky was. And the more distant objects were either things stuck to the ceiling or perhaps holes in the ceiling through which light could come from the outside. It was in the, the Middle Ages when people like Copernicus, Galileo, Newton came to the understanding and began to convince people that actually this isn't the center of the particular galaxy, the solar system, but the sun is. And now we can get beautiful pictures of the different planets and so on and estimate accurately their distance. But a hundred years or so ago, and I'll give you some details of this in just a moment for those of you who can't read it. A hundred years or so ago, there was an intense debate. It was called the Great Debate about the size of the universe. What were those distant objects? How far away are they? And it's only now, thanks to more modern ways of making measurements and things like the Hubble tel Telescope, that we can estimate these things more accurately. So the most distant objects shown here, what this line shows is the number of light years it would have taken for light to get to the Earth. Light travels at something like 180,000 miles a second. It takes minutes to get to us from the sun. From these more distant objects, it's 10 million years. Of course, they're, they're not there now. They weren't there when the photograph was taken because they'd already long gone somewhere else. It gives us a, a context of our little role in the world. I would find it very hard to believe that there aren't somewhere else on all these millions of galaxies planets on which a form of life has evolved. Perhaps many planets. It would be very difficult for us to communicate with them. But we'll just pause for a second just to look at some of the Hubble photographs. Sorry, my excuse for including this on a lecture on cells from cloned embryos is that my wife and I were in the Smithsonian Institute last summer and these are just stunning and it's just mind-blowing. So the thing on the right, which looks like a disc, is actually a tube thousands of light years long. You know, this is a huge place. To return to biology, during the 19th century, one of the key things in research, of course, was autopsies, and we all know about how some of those bodies uh, were obtained. Very different from today. At the beginning of the period that we're thinking about, 1800, it was not understood that bacteria cause infection. This was a major biological issue, a matter of heated debate at the time. Mal area, bad air. And it was only gradually as people began to understand the role of the little organisms that it became possible to use systematic approaches to vaccination. And I rather guess that every single one of us in this room is vaccinated against at least one thing, probably several. And it may well be one of the reasons why we are here, because we and our ancestors were immunized.
There are a huge list of things you could look at which have transformed our lives. I'll just read them. Sorry, I need to keep on remembering. You can't see things from the back. Nuclear physics, anesthetics, aeroplanes, antibiotics, computers, organ transplantation, transistors, sort of plucked out of the air. Let me just conclude with one more local case. Sir James Simpson, who in the mid-19th century was Professor of Obstetrics in the University of Edinburgh. Some of you will know that the clinic now is known as the Simpson in his honour. Among the things that he did was to introduce the use of anaesthetics during labour to try to reduce pain. Again, there was intense debate. What's the most appropriate gas to use? Chloroform or ether? And chloroform, I think, comes out as the winner. But there were scientific issues to discuss. But there were also ethical and social issues. It seems hard to believe now that there were people here in this city 150 years ago who argued that you should not give anaesthetic because women were intended to suffer during labour. It's true. So, a technical advance with ethical effects and impacts. It is recorded that at his funeral, 30,000 people lined the streets of Edinburgh. There wouldn't be many people of any way of life for whom that would be true. And the, he's buried in Westminster Abbey, and the inscription is, to whose genius and benevolence the world owes the blessings derived from the use of chloroform for, for the release of suffering. So what I've hoped I've shown you by this diversion is science makes progress in a somewhat erratic way, which you can rationalize afterwards. There is often intense debate about the science, about our current knowledge, and ethical debate. So let's turn to a current ethical issue, and the question of taking cells, using the cells of a human embryo for research and for therapy. And this is actually a picture of a, a human blastocyst provided by Austin Smith uh, for us. You can see that it's, as I said before, obtained about six days after fertilization, and it's of the order of 0.2 of a millimeter in diameter. If anything, that will be an overestimate. Now, not many of us are used to thinking about that sort of size. On the left, you have a salt grain. On the right, a sand grain. Things that we're all familiar with, and we know just how small they are. That's a sheep egg, unfertilized egg, which would be much the same size as a blastocyst, because the egg doesn't grow during that first week. The cells just divide and get smaller and smaller. So this is a minute group of cells. A group of about 200 cells. It's before the time of implantation in any of the species that we've mentioned. And there's been change into only two cell types, an outer layer which will make the contact with the reproductive tract of the mother, and the inner group, the inner cell mass, from which the fetus will develop. And it's from that inner cell mass, about 50 cells perhaps, from which stem cells are obtained. One of the other things that's happened, which we mentioned in the slide a minute or two ago, during the last 200 years, during the last 50 years, is the idea of transplanting organs from one person to another, usually from somebody who's died. And there was a very difficult period, a period of intense discussion and analysis, when it was recognized that, in some ways, an ideal person to donate organs would be somebody who had a brain injury because it was likely that their other organs would be, or possible that their other organs would be uh, healthy. The difficulty comes, how do you know if the brain is so badly damaged that it is appropriate to turn off the life support machine 
the ventilator. And there was analysis again in scientific debate, which for the specialists concerned enabled them to conclude that you could make reasonable predictions that if the brain was functioning in this sort of integrated way, it was likely that the person could recover and that therefore the machine should be left on. But if not, there was a negligible chance of recovery and therefore it would be acceptable to turn the machine off. I understand, I recognize, of course, that this is an issue which comes up from time to time. It came up again in the United States during the summer. The judgment being made that if this person had lost that function, then they could be considered as being dead in a functional way and it being appropriate to turn off their machine. I suggest that what we are having now is, if you like, an analogous debate about the beginning of life. When does the developing fetus become a person? Are all stages of development equally important? Should they all be treated the same? And I, of course, recognize that this view that I'm going to express is, to some people, deeply offensive. But the reason why I would be comfortable to use the cells of an embryo is because at this stage it has not developed a central nervous system. It is weeks away from that stage. And therefore there is no way in which it could be conscious or aware. And to me it's that ability to be aware which is the fundamental characteristic of being human. And I think the reasons why it is possible for us to obtain a license to do this in this country is because this is a view held by a majority of people and which was accepted by Parliament. To turn to the question of rabbit eggs, and we are considering putting in a proposal to, use, to be able to use rabbit eggs, to make a systematic comparison as to what we can achieve if we use a human oocytes, human eggs obtained in a variety of ways, and the eggs of the rabbit. The process is essentially the same, except the unfertilized egg would be taken from a rabbit. What happens when we do nuclear transfer in any species is that it's the proteins in that egg which actually do all of the work. They're what I think of as the magic factors. And still, almost 10 years after the birth of Dolly, we don't understand that. We have very limited understanding indeed of that process. So the scientific question is, are the proteins in the rabbit egg sufficiently similar to those in the human egg to enable them to change the functioning of the nucleus and allow it to support development so that embryo stem cells can be obtained? And the information from China, from the two different labs, suggests that that is the case. They still haven't had the opportunity to study gene expression carefully, so even if they have many of the characteristics of embryo stem cells, we sti still don't know if the cloning process disturbs gene function in such a way that it will camouflage the effect of a, an inherited disease. That critical step remains to be addressed. But to me, if we can use this, these, there are obvious practical advantages. It will be beneficial not to have to ask women to donate oocytes. Their oocytes can then be used in fertility treatment if they're willing to donate them for that purpose. And as this is again going to be a very early stage of development, I see no reason not to do this. I said that earlier on that we've chosen to focus on one disease. But I'd just like to mention that there are many others that could be studied in this way for which we would provide opportunities not available in any other way if the technology is effective. Other degenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's and so on, have inherited cases. So again, they could be studied in this way. Psychiatric diseases, schizophrenia, might be studied in this way. Cardiomyopathy, it's a function, malfunctioning, excuse me, malfunctioning of the heart which leads to sudden death. Often of very young fit people who suddenly fall over. 
not understood at all. It is clear that we could produce heart muscle cells in this way. That's very easily been done for a long time. So this could be studied in family. And of course, many of us will know that cancer, some cases of cancer are inherited, but the mutations responsible are only known in a small proportion of cases. We think of genes associated with breast cancer, but in fact only 30% of cases are they able to find a mutation. So in other words, there's many more mutations still to identify. And I'm sure there are many others. These are just ones that we've thought about or been approached uh, by potential collaborators wishing to work with us to study these diseases. So in conclusion then, looking to the future, I hope that I've shown you the contribution that science and other things have made in the past. But there is so much more still to come from medical research, and I'll stick to defending that. That's wide enough. So let's continue with our British tradition of ambitious research. But experience shows us that sometimes when we apply new knowledge, we make mistakes. And so there is a benefit in caution in the way in which we first use new knowledge. So ambitious research and cautious application. And surely that's an appropriate strategy to suggest for a university, for a city that was one of the seats of the Enlightenment 200 years ago. This is a photograph, I'm sorry, I'll leave this up. Maybe not, because my screensaver comes up when I do that. If anybody's interested, I'd be glad to show it to you. It's a photograph taken from roughly where the Lone Piper stands on Edinburgh Castle, looking down over the Esplanade, uh, down past St. Giles Church. Taken by Robert Adamson in 1843, uh, using a technique which was developed here in Edinburgh. Hill and Adamson were pioneers of this technology. So let's continue with ambitious research and cautious application. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Wilmot, I'm going to ask uh, Palab uh, to respond immediately, if he would, to that, uh, that talk. Thank you very much, Michael, and um, thank you to the BBSRC and to Ian for inviting me to uh, respond to Ian's talk. Um, Ian, that was a fantastic talk, very clear as ever, explaining the potential of uh, cloning technology. My job is, um, if you like, to stir things up a bit, play a devil's advocate, to raise some of the issues. I want to stress that, as the BBC Science correspondent, my job is to report in this area. But I don't think it's right that I should have a view either pro or anti the technology. But in this case, what I'd like to do is to take together some of the concerns just to stimulate some debate. And I hope they'll stimulate some questions um, afterwards because in some ways that's what this evening is really all about, for you to ask questions and to make your contribution. First of all, I'd just like to say that it can't be overstated what Ian's contribution to this area has been. Uh, up until the creation of Dolly, mice had been cloned, uh, frogs had been cloned, but uh, the creation of Dolly will probably change the world in w ways we have yet to imagine. Ian mentioned some of the things that could be done, um, but there are all sorts of other things that could happen, and um, it all started here. So Ian, I think, can be regarded as the father of modern cloning. And it's for this reason that uh, because the technology has the power to transform society in such a way, because, and especially because we're dealing with things that aren't to do with the discovery of other planets or the Earth's place in the solar system. It's the very stuff of life. And I think that these meetings are so important because it's a technology that requires not just the public's consent, but the public's contribution. And I hope that um, when it comes to your turn, that um, you'll make your feelings and concerns known because 
it, it's, it's a moving feast, really. It's what you think, what the country thinks that will drive the technology, because it's a, it's a decision that's too important to be left just to scientists and journalists and politicians. Debate, uh, the debate that Ian was talking about that's been had over various controversial scientific and medical technologies is good, and provided we have a critical and informed public, we'll make sure that we get it right and make fewer mistakes. Now, I'd like to say that if Ian is the father of modern cloning, then he's had a few naughty children. Now, I'm not talking about um, his daughters, which uh, I'm assured by his wife are, are wonderful, but the um, people, some people that have followed in his footsteps, um, people like Ian can be thought of in some ways as a Martin Luther Kings of uh, science. They have a dream of using cloning technology to cure horrible diseases, but there are other people, notably you might have heard of Panos Zavos from the University of Kentucky, who wants to cl clone human beings by any means necessary, the Malcolm X's of uh, cloning science. So I think that um, responsible scientists like Ian would abhor the thought of cloning a human being. Uh, you've heard the kind of things he, that he wants to do with the technology to alleviate suffering. But um, th there are problems with uh, the technique uh, if it were used to clone human beings. Most cloned animals um, don't come to term uh, when they're put through the process. The surrogate mothers often miscarry. And those that are born are often born deformed and die within a, f in a few days or weeks of uh, being born. And even now, we're not sure what the healthy cloned animals are like. Um, Dolly the sheep, for example, probably died sooner than she might have been expected. We're still not sure, but she developed arthritis. Um, sheep don't tend to live too long for obvious reasons, but, uh, but it's thought that uh, she might have been aging prematurely. And we still don't know if humans are cloned because of our complex brains, what effect it might have on mental faculties. So cloning is not a good idea. But the temptation to clone a human being is huge because the first, even though it's illegal and frowned upon, the person that does it first will be in the history books forever. And some are convinced that uh, someone somewhere will try and do this, even if they are not already. And Personally, I think that someone somewhere eventually will. Many scientists say that there are regulations there to stop this sort of thing from happening. We've got the HFEA in this country, but there are regulations against robbing banks, and that still happens. Greed is a powerful motivator. In the process of this or these people trying to clone a human being, there will be, I hope this doesn't happen, but potentially there's the possibility of women miscarrying as people are trying to do this. Though there's a possibility of women being exploited for their eggs. I mean, Ian explained the problem of eggs being a barrier to research, but uh, Professor Huang uh, from uh, Korea, who doesn't want to clone a human being, Allegedly, he put pressure on his own researchers and unethically obtained eggs. So the pressure is there. And e even if one day it's shown that the technology can be used safely, people like Panos Zavos, people who say they want to clone a human being, say they want to do it to help infertile couples, uh, for people who don't want to rely on sperm donation, but there's still the possibility that once the genie's out of the bottle, people will want to use it for less uh, noble reasons. There's the temptation, out of sheer vanity, for people to clone themselves. And the technology could also, as, as Ian uh, demonstrated, the technology can be used to uh, find out more about gene expression, to cure diseases, but that's, those same techniques could be used to enhance people's abilities, to make people taller and stronger and more attractive, and whatever more attractive might be. So, if, it, if all this sounds like science fiction, just remember what Professor Huang did in South Korea, 
as I said, there was the possible coercion of uh, female members of his lab staff to get eggs. He made up uh, his data on cloning the first human embryo, creating the first genetically matched stem cells. He wasn't trying to clone a human being, but he wanted the prestige of being the first to go down in the history books. And that pressure is there for other scientists, and, that is, and it's that pressure that may well result in good scientists possibly doing bad things. But even if no one does try, doesn't try and clone a human being, surely it's all right to use human embryos, this controversial area of research, to cure some of the diseases of ageing. Um, it's only surely just a, a small minority that are opposed to using human embryonic material to try and cure diseases like motor neuron disease. But the, the way in which um, scientists like Ian present it, possibly, just possibly, the argument's been overhyped. Um, when the legislation was being uh, considered in the House of Commons, I remember, as someone who was covering the episode, that perhaps intentionally, perhaps unintentionally, the potential of this technology was overhyped. It was thought that uh, the diseases of aging would be cured far sooner. But even now, it's a, it's a slow process. Some of the things that Ian's talking about is going to take an awful long time. And that while MPs were considering whether to allow this kind of research to go on, perhaps the message was oversold. Even now, stem cells can only turn into nerve tissue rather than the various tissues of, of the human body. And left to themselves, they, they probably would do that anyway. So there's a long way to go before any of this is realized. So Ian talked about um, medical research increasing life expectancy from the 1800s, but an awful lot of that was, was due to plumbing. You know, you, and I'm not arguing against medical research, but there potentially are certain areas that uh, we shouldn't go down, not for any superstition, but for strong ethical reasons. Fifteen years ago or so, a, a noted philosopher, Mary Warnock, uh, was asked to consider the implications of uh, using embryos uh, for research. Obviously, this was in the days before cloning and stem cell research. She was considering it for uh, fertility treatments, test tube technologies. And after much consideration, uh, her conclusion was that it was right to use embryos and to do limited research to improve fertility treatments, but she determined that embryos did have a special status, even at the early stage that Ian was talking about, even at that tiny, smaller than sand level, and they shouldn't be used frivolously. But then the potential for curing diseases emerged, and then Parliament was asked to reconsider that judgment. Essentially, Mary Warnock drew a line in the sand, and Parliament rubbed that line out and redrew it because of the potential benefits to the technology, to the diseased and dying. And what I'd like to do is just finish off just by posing the question is to ask whether that decision is one that will enhance the human spirit and improve society, or one that, if we're not careful, might diminish it. Thank you very much.